Well, hello, everyone. So glad you've joined us. My name is John Maddox, and uh, this is uh, Thursday, September 10th, 2020. I trust you're all doing well, and as promised, we have a very special uh, interview for you today. I've been looking forward to this for some time. Just want for you to imagine yourself right now in the glorious Hagia Sophia Cathedral, participating in the Divine Liturgy in the medieval Byzantine era. What would it sound like? Could we ever really know? Can technology export us back in time so that if we close our eyes, we can almost smell the incense and hear the music and the chanting? Well, today we're going to learn about a project that does take you there and does give you that experience, at least as close to the real thing as possible. We're going to be talking to Capella Romana today and Icons in Sound. Capella Romana is a professional vocal ensemble that performs early and contemporary music in the Christian traditions of East and West. The ensemble is known especially for its presentations and for its uh, recording of medieval Byzantine chant, uh, the Eastern sibling of Gregorian chant, if you will, Greek and Russian Orthodox choral works, and other sacred music that expresses the historic traditions of a unified Christian inheritance. And today we have with us, first of all, Mark Powell. And uh, Mark is the executive director of Capella Romana. Mark, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. And so, Mark, before we bring in others, give us an overview of Capella Romana, and uh, how long has it been exi in existence, and uh, uh, what are the things you're up to these days? Sure. Well, you gave a very good summary, uh, which we, that kind of language we use all the time, uh, just to give a very... A clear thumbnail sketch of, of who we are. Um, you'll meet Alexander Lingus here briefly, and he is the founder of Capella Romana, uh, which started in 1991. So next April, we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary mm. of existence. Uh, during that time, we've done all those kinds of music that you described, as well as, uh, you know, things further afield, including music from the Orthodox traditions in Finland, uh, from Serbia, from uh, lots of other places than just the Greek and Russian uh, polarities. And it's, a, as you say, it's a professional ensemble. All of our singers are paid. Uh, that's a very important part of our, um, of our work. And uh, they've been paid from the very beginning, even when it was, you know, just a few, a few dollars for, you know, going to the bar afterwards, uh, but it was very important that uh, it be a professional ensemble. Um, our singers come from all over the place, and um, in, in addition to those that are based here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, for the Medieval Byzantine Chant Projects, we do uh, use singers from all over the world, including from Greece, uh, from the United Kingdom, from uh, all over the United States, and uh, so there, there's a uh, a very strong dedication to using the very, very best uh, singers who are able to produce these uh, projects, these live concerts and recordings. That's awesome. <clears throat> and uh, we want to go across the pond now and bring in Alexander Linkus, who is the music director and founder of Capella Romana. Uh, welcome to you, Alexander, and uh, tell us where do we find you today? Hello, I'm at my uh, home in Didcot, Oxfordshire. That's about uh, 12 miles from the city of Oxford and 60-odd some from the city of London. All right. And so well, uh, tell us about uh, your involvement with Capella Romanda, uh, apparently right from the very beginning. Uh, how, how, tell us about the, how it started. Well, it started with uh, a group of friends. Um, I had gathered groups of singers together when I was a postgraduate student, actually in school I was an undergraduate student, and we were doing things from time to time, mostly Western Baroque music. Um, and it happened that I was a cantor at the Greek Orthodox Cathedral in San Francisco. And the building that we were in was a temporary building because the previous building, cathedral, uh, had been demolished as a result of the earthquake that had recently happened. Oh my. The Loma Prieta earthquake, and they were just starting the fundraising. 
And as a, as a post-grad student, I wasn't able to give them a million dollars or anything. But what I could do is get my friends together and hold a benefit concert. Okay. And um, so we did. I got my friends together and um, we did Orthodox music from um, the time of Hagia Sophia up to the present. John Taverner and, and modern Greek American. Oh, yeah. Composers. So, uh, and... It seemed to work, so we decided to keep it going, and here we are now, almost thirty years later. Wow! Well, it's been amazing to see the <clears throat> the output from Capella Romana, and we've watched from afar with great admiration uh, your work and Mark's and uh, others who have been involved, and uh, always enjoy getting new CDs from you, so we could play on Ancient Faith. So, uh, talk a little bit about your. Uh, uh, involvement and how the seed was planted for this project, The Lost Voices of Agia Sophia. Well, this project was really a convergence of scholars working at the forefronts of their field in different places. Um, so, I mean, my own involvement with the right of Agia Sophia goes back to that postgraduate work I was mentioning. Um, I wrote my doctoral thesis on the Sunday morning prayer in the Rite of Hagia Sophia, uh, and that, I completed that in 1996. Um, and so elements of that tradition were part of what I had been doing with Capella Roman and also with other groups like the Greek Byzantine Choir of Lycurgos Angelopoulos. Uh, here in Oxford in 2001, we reconstructed a Vesper service according to the old rite of Hagia Sophia, probably the first time in oh. 500 years that that wow. service had been celebrated, uh, with Metropolitan mm. Talistos Ware uh, celebrating and mm. the uh, the lead priest being Father um, Ephraim Lash. So it was really quite quite an occasion. There was a Historic. nice college dinner afterwards in the, in the St. Peter's College. So um, So basically, and then... From another side of things, uh, our wonderful colleagues at Stanford University, uh, Ms. Arpancheva, who's uh, a, a, at the forefront of work in art history in, and architecture and its interpretation in Byzantium, um, became approached it from her angle as well. And then also, as you'll hear, um, she was working together with her colleague at the Center for Computer Music uh, Research and Acoustics, uh, Jonathan Abel. Uh, on who was interested in the acoustics from a technical side. Ah, so yes. How this all came together was really a convergence of people who were working deeply in their own specialties, um, and that uh, then we uh, and then well, I, I'm sure you can refer you to our colleagues at at Stanford who were the ones who originated the Icons of Sound project itself, and there's quite a story to tell there. Well, I want to hear that story, and I think this would be a good time to bring Becerra in. Uh, Becerra Pencheva, uh, I'm sorry, would you pronounce your last name? Pencheva? Pencheva. Pencheva. It's always on the first. Got it. My Very apologies. Well. So, uh, Becerra, so the idea actually began at Stanford, and I'd be fascinated to know uh, how that idea uh, was uh, germinated and uh, your involvement in that. First of all, I would like to thank you, John, for inviting all of us uh, for this interview. This is an honor for Capella Romana and for Icons of Sound. And it also honors the collaboration that is now more than 10 years. Um, Hagia Sophia is a masterpiece of world architecture, but it also has a very complex uh, history as a result of which being transformed from a mosque into a museum in 1934 there was an immediate ban on any use of this space for religious services, which means uh, any performance of the human voice or instrumental music. So when we started working um, in 2008, um, I had discovered an um, article by Technische Universität of uh, studies of the acoustics of the space that brought some really amazing results of uh, over uh, 12 seconds reverberation time, which for uh, our contemporary audiences is quite extraordinary because we're used to much drier interiors. Did you say and, 12 uh, seconds? Yes, 12 seconds for certain frequencies, reverberation time of over 12 seconds. Think of it. So, for Think instance, drone could last more than 12 seconds. It's uh, with its um, uh, frequencies of 30 dB, <laughs> around 30 dB, it is really long in Hagia Sophia, as well as some of the uh, high frequencies in that space. It's amazing. So, um, 
it was uh, fascinating to discover this information. And uh, at that point, I connected with uh, the Center for Computer Re Research in Music and Acoustics through a graduate student, Miriam Collar, who was working on Peru. And Miriam was uh, collaborating with Jonathan Abel. And that's how I met this fascinating institution. Oh, I think yeah, I froze up a little Stanford, bit. Oh, there you are. Center Go ahead. for Computer Research. And I asked Jonathan, I'm still freezing, I see. Uh, <laughs> Let me move over to, uh, let me see if we can bring Jonathan in here. Uh, Jonathan, we have a picture of you, and but can we hear you? I think you can. We thank can. You for me. Well, thank you for being on. And uh, the reason yeah. we have a picture of Jonathan is uh, he's struggling with uh, migraines these days, and screens are not his friend. Let me just put it that way. And uh, so we just appreciate you being uh, on at all today uh, in the okay. midst of this challenge. It's my pleasure and uh, and a uh, nice distraction and maybe I can fill in a little bit while Bisa's connection gets reestablished. Yes, please do. Um, but yeah, so um, so it, as uh, Bisa was saying at the at, at sort of the start of the project, um, she had met Miriam Kolar, and I was um, working with Miriam uh, at the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics on this project that she was. Um, working with John Rick, a Stanford archaeologist in, uh, called Chavin de Huantar in the northern highlands of Peru. And it's interesting, it's the, the, this, this space is almost the opposite of Hagia Sophia, where Hagia Sophia has this just incredibly voluminous interior, you know, so it's sort of, sort of like the largest dome structure um, on the planet for, you know, uh, millennium. And Chavin is, you know, similarly huge and monumental, but it's all these very narrow, twisty, turny kind of corridors, and um, and sound was important there. And and so when working with Miriam, um, what we were wanting to do was kind of understand how folks would experience sound in this space. And you know, we had developed various methods to understand and reproduce kind of the soundscape of this space. And then Miriam and uh, Bisara met, um, you know, both of them describing their work. And Bisara came by and was talking about this incredible structure, Hagia Sophia, and how, you know, just, um, I, I, you know, like uh, engaging, immersive, and transcendent the sensory experience would have been there. And and she would had had showed us this paper that she had uncovered that described a um, a acoustic of the space, a reverberation that lasted nearly twelve seconds. You know, for like sort of the range of the human singing voice. I mean, think about that. Like, yeah, you know, clap that's your amazing. Hands. You clap your hands. <laughs> you can count one, three. Four, you're right. Yeah, it's still going. Well, we have it's a little demonstration going. of that in a second, and we do have Bissera back. So, Bissera, anything that you would like Great. to add, or what we missed from you? Uh, very briefly, um, the important part was um, we um, embarked on trying to get acoustic data from Hagia Sophia, and I was the person who traveled. I am not trained as an acoustician or engineer, and we decided we are going to use very basic tools in order to obtain acoustic data from one of the most acoustically complex buildings. I used a balloon pop that I recorded <laughs> with a handheld recorder, and I was allowed to do four of these balloon pops in the space, uh, and afterwards, Jonathan extracted from this data the acoustic signature of Hagia Sophia. This was done in 2010, and in 2011, we invited Capella Romana with our first experiment to give them immediate feedback as they're singing to eventually do live oralization, meaning that they sing with the simultaneous imprinting of the acoustics of Hagia Sophia, which changed the way Capella Romana sang. Of because course. They could interact with the building live and really understand how to use it as an instrument of the human voice.
Well, before we go too far, I actually have a clip of that balloon pop uh, experiment that uh, you were involved with, with uh, Jonathan describing a little bit what was happening. Is it okay with you if we play that? Absolutely. When you're singing in Hagia Sophia, the sound radiates from your mouth, it goes and it fills the building. It interacts with the colonnades and it interacts with the dome, the semi-domes, comes back to the listener and brings copies of the sound that came out of the singer's voice a while back. So that's what we want to reproduce. And the first thing we do is we go to Hagia Sophia and we make measurements. In 2010, Sarah Pencheva went to Hagia Sophia. She had a couple balloons with her, talked a guard into popping a balloon, standing where the choir would be. And she, all right, was wearing a couple microphones by her ears and a little handheld recorder. The balloon pops. Wow. Sound rings out through the building, bringing back hints of that architecture to Bisura's ears. That's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. So, Bisura, you were there. Uh, you say you did that four times? Correct. <laughs> what was your first feeling when you heard that sound? It is pretty shocking. <laughs> because bet. it sounds like a pistol shot in that space. Exactly. And I was not expecting this uh, children's toy to create such an aggressive and violent sound. Yeah. But I got used to it I was scaffolding so the sound of the metal clanking in that space is already there with attention to the acoustics it's an incredible feast for the years in a sense yes. you can sit and listen to this um, enveloping and non-intimate sound of Hagia Sophia and I also would like to tell the listeners uh, to this interview that there is a documentary film that Duygu Eruchman produced um, um, Directed, it's called The Voice of Hagia Sophia, and this was an excerpt from the film. I had an opportunity to watch that myself, and it is just amazing. Just phenomenal. Uh, and Mark and Alexander, what is it that you included with the CD? There was a mention of a documentary that is included with, with the, uh, the project. And is that this, or is this something else? That's it. No, that's it. The voice of Hagia Sophia. It's included on the Blu-ray that comes uh, as a companion with the CD. So it's uh, so viewers can uh, and listeners who who purchase the CD and Blu-ray combination uh, can see this documentary. Well, uh, so Alexander, you uh, uh, as as Bissera mentioned, you recorded the group uh, Capella Romana actually here in the states. And then through the magic of technology, the acoustical pattern was somehow overlaid. Is that how I understand it? Not so okay. much. Correct. Uh, the, see, this is the, the difference here with the normal way. I mean, for, it's been a while that um, groups have been able to record various sounds and then add, you know, reverberation, add further yeah. uh, echo and so on. But uh, in this case, what is unique about this Stanford process, why we were very much on the cutting edge of things, the work that, uh, that uh, Bissera and Jonathan had done, was that we were able to sing in real time and hear ourselves in Hagia Sophia as if we were actually singing in a large cathedral, which we've done many times and we've performed at St. Paul's here in of London. Of course, of course. So, um, and so the, the, it was the first time we came to Stanford, we were in the Bay Area to do another concert and then we came in the afternoon afterwards, I think after singing Sunday Liturgy actually, uh, and uh, we came out to Stanford and we had this forest of microphones in front of us and we heard Hagia Sophia through uh, earphones. Oh my. Through heads and, and it was this experience to be you know hearing the yourself you when we're in this studio uh and then all of ourselves and the, and the engineers were able to say now where might you be standing and you know place <laughs> us in different places uh, it was really uh, quite a revelation so we we had our uh repertoire from that tradition of Hagia Sophia that we'd sung on other programs other of concerts course. and we and we we tested it out 
with this live oralization, which is really a, a stunning technology. It is amazing. Well, let's play this little clip, Alexander, and then maybe you can tell us afterwards what, what it is that we have seen here. Wow. <laughs> I mean, nobody's ever sung this piece, as far as I know. It's, it is. It's, it's, very, it's very odd, though. So it's, it's just, um, uh, we just need to... Um, In 17, is that F sharp with a question mark? Uh, uh, what do you think? Yeah. F sharp? F sharp. F sharp. Let's sing F sharp. Capella Romana frequently has this experience of singing music that hasn't been sung in centuries. We specialize in the music of, of the Byzantine Empire and its church music. Because so much of this hasn't been sung in recent times, and the melodies in some cases are quite a bit different from the melodies that are used in today's churches, it's always a kind of voyage of discovery for us. So, John, can you give us a, the intonation? No. The oralization adds to our experience of singing this music in terms of giving a sense of space, especially in terms of understanding what kind of tempo might have been correct for this music. As a singer, you're always reacting to the environment around you, so this is a chance for us to have some sense of what it would be like to perform it in Hagia Sophia. Now, when we perform in a place like Bing, using the oralization technology, we have to bifurcate our brains a bit. Because effectively, you're dealing with two acoustics, the acoustics that, that is heard by the audience and the, your acoustic on the stage. But in terms of the way that you choose your tempos and so on, I found it to be very similar to a natural acoustic. The singers are performing as they would perform in Hagia Sophia without amplification. So their voices have to fill the hall. What our system is doing is adding to Bing what Hagia Sophia would do to those voices. All right. Wow. So Alexander and, uh, and Mark, uh, what is it that we, uh, that we saw there? What were you actually doing? Well, this was part of the process of uh, doing the music for the, uh, for the actual Voices of Hagia Sophia disc. So this is, uh, as opposed to what I was talking about before, which was the beginning of the process, and there were things that had happened before Capella arrived yeah. in Icons of Sound, um, that this is sort of the summit of the process, where we are putting together a full-length program, oralized live in Bing Concert Hall, uh, with all the beautiful images uh, that were s uh, set up. And uh, you saw us at the beginning there, uh, rehearsing the Trubic Hymn. And Mark, you were mentioning uh, about uh, the, the value of the Blu-ray and the surround sound. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, this was the first recording that we produced uh, with a high-resolution uh, uh, stereo mix that's, um, that's on the Blu-ray. But in addition to that, so for audiophiles, they'll enjoy that. Uh, but in addition, there, there is uh, a number of formats for surround sound listening. So someone with an ordinary five-channel uh, surround sound at home can listen with uh, sound behind and sound in front. Um, but the other thing that's different about this is this was also recorded with sound above. And so if you have uh, certain kinds of encoders, Dolby Atmos or Aura 3D, you can actually listen to this recording um, with sound above. And so you really do hear, uh, as Babisada has discussed before, this showering rain of sound that comes <laughs> back from the dome. Um, and it is a very different experience. Um, we made some really big investments to make this possible, and we mastered it at Skywalker Sound, where so many film scores are, are sure. made. 
And uh, so we, we really invested some, some in important resources and money, of course, into that. And, and the result is, is just stunning. Oh, yeah. And we've all that, yeah. valued it from it. So thank you. Go ahead, Alexander. No, just that, that we there very much includes uh, Stanford because we had our recording engineers, we had uh, uh, members of Stanford's team, Mark and I at various times at Skywalker. So again, the, the level of collaboration was very much was total in this uh, enterprise. Becerra, would you want to talk to that too about that collaboration? It has always the, been extremely um, rewarding to work together and the uh, Late Robert Taft uh, once said that um, the beauty of this work is in bringing all these different voices together, and together we stand strong. It has been, uh, it is in the interchange, in the overlap between the different fields that the discoveries really happen. And what was one of the most important insights in the project is that how much of the manifestation of the metaphysical in medieval culture was a phenomenon. It's ephemeral and it, it requires this human participation and what we consider as inanimate, a building, that all of a sudden in interaction, in synergy, creates something that doesn't exist otherwise. So, for instance, this acoustic golden rains, which is produced by the sonic attacks on the dome, is something that is invisible, intangible, but the moment the voice activates the space, it happens. And so uh, I would say that... We have thought about history in terms of texts and material traces, but history, and especially with the work of Capella Romana, which is bringing to life music that exists in manuscripts, scores mm. that very few people could read, with the performance and with the use of the digital technology, with what Karma with Jonathan Abo is capable mm. of doing, really brings us into the experience of the, experience of, of the past, which is so important. Mm, what a gift you've all given to us. Thank you for that. And Alexander, I can just hear uh, the world shouting at me right now. Let us hear something. I'm tired. Don't talk anymore about it. I want to hear it. So let's uh, set up uh, this piece that uh, you've selected, uh, which is a treatment of Psalm 140. Right. So that's one of the most familiar psalms in the Orthodox tradition as we know it today. It's sung at every Vespers, every evening prayer. Uh, Lord, I cried to thee, or Lord, I call on thee. And uh, in today, when we're used to hearing it, we're used to hearing it um, sung in a particular mode or tone. And then, but the sort of the main feature of it is the hymns that are then tacked on afterwards, all these hymns that we call stichia. Now, the old rite of Hagia Sophia um, didn't have all those hymns. No. Uh, uh, Vespers, Evening Prayer to Hagia Sophia, had very few hymns indeed. It didn't even have gladsome light. Hmm. And so for Psalm 140, what you had was just a single refrain that would be repeated after each verse. And this comes back from early Christian times when uh, refrains were used between psalm verses to encourage congregational participation. All right, well, let's listen to that together and then uh, we can comment some more afterwards.
Oh, it's beautiful. I wish we could just take time to hear the whole thing, but, Alexander, people can buy the CD and uh, hear the whole thing. It's just absolutely beautiful. You know, anything else you'd like to say about that piece? Because I want to bring Jonathan in t- from a technical standpoint in a second. Sure. Just a, a couple of comments. One, again, the refrain is very short. Uh, the English translation is, it is only to you, O Lord and Master, that we send up our evening hymn, Have Mercy on Us. So very brief, very easy, once you hear it once or twice, for members of the congregation to learn it and to repeat it with the choirs. The other thing I would note is that you hear women singing Mm -hmm. on our recording. And we're so used to the sound of of male Byzantine choirs these days. Um, And one of the things that we know about the soundscape at Hagia Sophia Mm -hmm. was that uh, they had high voices there. They had... Uh, boys from the Imperial Orphanage who would mm. sing at some times. They, there was a choir of deaconesses who sang at various times. Um, and also uh, that a number of the male singers, the adult male singers in the choir, were actually eunuchs, castrati. So they were mm. high-voiced males. So this was actually something that Western travelers visiting Constantinople before the Fourth mm. Crusade mm. noted that was different about the sound, and it was very distinctive for them, the mix of high and low voices in the pre-1204 Byzantine church. And that's something that we really don't have uh, today in the same way. Interesting. Yeah, fascinating. That is really interesting. Well, let's put our geek hats on again. And Jonathan, talk a little bit about uh, the uh, technical aspect of that particular recording in the CD. Right, yes. So... um, it turns out with like a, with a place like Hagia Sophia that presents so much um, and it just such a rich mix of acoustics that what happens is that the singers in the building are just sort of like like, like the singers almost playing the building as if it's another instrument. You, you hear how the voices are transformed. Um, you hear all of the changes in, in the, you know, you know, the tempo is slowed, there's changes in phrasing, you know, to let the building ring out to, there's all this interaction, the, you know, the folks doing the ESON are going to just microscopically adjust their pitch to get mm. these, to get the, you know, to just land on some of the resonances of the building. Yeah. And, and, and if you listen, you'll hear these like really sparkling, high frequency, almost just like, you know, it, it's like the angel singing, you know, raining down from the dome. And, and it's the, the, this interaction is just integral to the performance, to the experience, to what the performers are, are, are doing, to what um, listeners hear. And, and in putting this technology together, it was really important to maintain that interaction. And, and in developing the technology, what we ended up, we were able to um, capture the sound right at the, right at the chanter's mm-hmm. mouths. And so close miking the sound, yep. we did a bunch of processing based on that balloon pop that we sort of recorded to understand how the acoustics in Hagia Sophia would treat their voices. And we imprinted the effect of that on the singer's voices and we had and we had to do it in real time and we also even though we started off over headphones we really had to do this over loudspeakers so they could move around the space and they could have all the usual interactions that they did with each other and mm. and and it's this interaction that is it's it, it was one of the striking things to me um how intimately the space is coupled with the singing. Mm. It's um, it, it, it almost just becomes this one entity. It's um, and and especially you know if you take a listen to the Eson, yeah, you know, it's just sort of built up. It, it's almost like they're building a way for everybody else to surf on. Wow, um, I like that analogy. It's just, uh, it, it's just a beautiful thing. And then and and, and so this it turns out, you know. As far as we know, I think this is the very first recording that's been produced that was done entirely in live virtual acoustics. Okay. The, the recording was done, and and Alex and Mark can speak to this. That they, they were, you know, that I mean, Alex was directing in this in in 
in this um, uh, stage at the little little 150 seat recital hall at uh, at uh, Karma. That's what we call the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Um, and you know we and they were positioned in a way that they could interact with each other and they could see each other and and in fact, so, so we were able to capture, because they were experiencing the acoustics as they were singing, back when we did the post-production, as we're doing the mixing and mastering and that kind of stuff, we could actually, um, we, we captured their voices right at their, right at their mouths and in the room, and we were able to reproduce them, and we could even reposition them. And another thing that Alex could talk about is, you know, how we actually positioned, you know, the you know, the priest or the deacon compared to the rest of the choir to create this entire experience. Wow. Well, that's a technical uh, masterpiece and something that wasn't even possible that many years ago to be able to do that now and uh, to be able to place us there. I mean, that to me is a thrilling part. And it just made me think so much, Alexander, of sacred space and the combination of not just the people, the icons, the liturgy, the music, but the space itself. And you've, you, all of you have used the term, the music rained down on us. And that's so uh, descriptive of uh, what the experience sounds like. And so uh, I, I just can't uh, recommend this uh, highly enough. One of the, um, I'll start with the metaphor. The building is a building a wave on which the voices surf. It's connected to it. Um, this close linkage between ornament, space, and human participation. Hagia Sophia in its 6th century interior did not have monumental human figures, and the marble evokes water. And so this wet space, reverberant space, is perceived as wet, and it brings the metaphysical as the sound of the sea in an empire that was very much connected to the sea as well. And so this is a, we have two aspects of water and of glittering golden rain. Hmm. And one is the hmm. dome and the other one is the marble in the space. And the two okay. really build up this transformative experience. Hmm. Well, well put. That, that's a good description of that. And uh, so, uh, Mark, uh, I know people would love to know how they can take advantage of, uh, of what you have done and get it, not only the CD, but the Blu-ray and the marvelous liner notes that are included. Uh, talk to a little bit about the production itself and how can people get it. Sure. Uh, first, I, I want to thank Visita for, for bringing, bringing up this this transformative experience, given ancient faith radio is heard by so many Orthodox people, um, you know, it's important to remember that um, in the primary chronicle, which we learn about how the Slavs, you know, came to Hagia Sophia, and they knew not whether they were in heaven or mm -hmm. on earth, that a key part of that, uh, as, as Mislava said, was not about monumental human figures, but about this this space and the and the experience of being in that building, um, they would have heard eunuchs. They would have heard these high voices as well as the low, as, as Alexander uh, mentioned. And and we've tried to recapture that, of course, in in the production. Um, my colleagues, of course, uh, mentioned the booklet. It's it's something that Capella Romana values greatly. All of our recordings have extensive notes, and in this case, we have three essays one by uh, each of my three colleagues uh, about the uh, liturgical and musicological side, the phenomenological side, and the technological side uh, by Alexander Visita and, and, uh, and Jonathan, respectively. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, of course, is that um, uh, we, we want to put forward something that um, really engages the listener um, you know, photographically, so we curated a number of images in the in the booklet from lots of different sources. Um, I had many emails with the Vatican Library trying to get rights for these things. It was um, it was a, a, a drawn out process, but very much uh, worth it to serve our audiences. So um, the recording is available basically everywhere you can buy music. So it's available on our own website as well as Amazon and you know through all the download services. Uh, services. So um, yeah, it's you can you can find it virtually everywhere. 
It's also available uh, just about any place you buy CDs. And I also want to promote the Icons of Sound website uh, because uh, <clears throat> the work at Stanford University on this project, obviously it wouldn't have happened without them. And you can reach them at iconsofsound.stanford.edu. Icons of Sound is all one word, dot Stanford dot edu uh and then uh alexander anything else from you well just what a, a great pleasure it's been to be able to share this with our um uh, predominantly orthodox audience of ancient faith radio um that this is work that's happened in the academy uh, and it's something that again we get used to in the orthodox mm -hmm. church we're always citing precedent you know we talk about how ancient our services are and so on but um there really haven't been that many opportunities actually to share what some of these ancient services were like with uh, the wider uh, public within the Orthodox Church. So uh, very grateful for this opportunity. Our privilege. And I want to just thank each of you for your participation today. It was fascinating. I think people are going to uh, enjoy watching this again uh, as it uh, will become available on YouTube uh, right after the uh, Live recording is done. You'll hear it, be able to watch it on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. And it'll also be on Ancient Faith Radio on the Ancient Faith Presents section uh, so that you can either listen or watch or both. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll do just that. Any last comments from anyone? I'd like to just mention that yes. uh, we did a, a very short uh, section of this project on a, a six-city tour with an organization called Pop-Up Magazine. Huh? It sold out houses with, you know, up to 7,000 people at a time. And most of those folks were not Orthodox. Okay. Most of those folks were under the age of 35. And reviews from that experience where people had never, probably never heard of Byzantium in some cases, um, they, were, they had tears in their eyes and they were, they were so moved. Um, it was, it was really something else to interact with those audience members after and just get their impressions of what they experienced. And again, they, I imagine, probably didn't know if they were in heaven or uh, on earth. As I well. can imagine. Yeah, undoubtedly. <clears throat> wow. Well, we truly hope you enjoyed our interview today with our guests, Mark Powell, who is the executive director of Capella Romana, Alexander Lingus, who is the music director and founder, Bissera Pancheva, who is a professor of art at Stanford University, and Jonathan Abel with the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics at Stanford. And we're going to leave you today with this beautiful rendition of the Troparion of the Cross. Again, this is from the Lost Voices of Hagia Sophia Project. Thanks for watching and listening. <laughs>